Hello and welcome everyone uh, to day two of the online symposium, It's Been Too Hot, the reality of coffee farming in the era of climate change by the Initiative for Coffee and Climate. Um, for those who haven't been here yesterday, my name is Annika Nicolaudius and I guide you through this uh, two days event. Um, yeah, well, yesterday we already started with a, a quite enlightening and inspiring session, as I would say. <laughs> Um, we had the first uh, two blocks uh, of topics. Uh, we started with the first block um, that gave a bit of an overview on the challenges that climate change brings with it. Uh, we uh, learned about the different perspectives uh, of stakeholders inside the coffee value chain. Uh, we learned about uh, the impacts of climate change on uh, coffee growing regions and um, that there's uh, often I basically uh, always a need for adaptation, that there's a need for diversification, and sometimes even uh, the need for transformation. And uh, we also learned about food security, um, a topic that is, uh, yeah, a very basic uh, need that really needs to be met uh, before everything else, but uh, unfortunately most of the time is not even uh, considered in sustainability projects. Um, so that was uh, the first block yesterday. The second block uh, yeah, shed a bit light on solution approaches, uh, was yeah, giving a bit um, hope uh, for solutions. And um, we uh, learned about the manifold uh, benefits of the land use management system of agroforestry. Uh, we got to know a bit more about circular economy uh, to make smart use of waste. Uh, we learned how compost, bokashi, and biochar is being produced in Brazil. And um, yeah, we also learned about um, how uh, to integrate uh, youth into climate action in Honduras with the climate pioneers. Um, so uh, today we are um, going into the third part of uh, our symposium. Uh, we are going to dive a bit into the barriers and potential pitfalls because, uh, yeah, as I yesterday already said, uh, we don't only want to focus on everything that is going well and only present success stories, uh, but also uh, we want to point out a bit, um, yeah, some uh, yeah potential um, points where it can get uh, where you can get to failure. Um, so we have invited four uh, speakers who will report a bit about their own experiences in implementing projects and um, these, um, yeah, let's say a little pitfalls um, are, that we are presenting today um, are in the area of uh, participation, uh, gender, finance and digitalization. So I think that is a, a very nice and wide range of different uh, topics and a lot to learn. Um, yeah, and um, yesterday we also had a very strong engagement of the audience. I don't know who have, of you have already been here yesterday, um, but uh, it was really a pleasure to um, receive so many questions. And I hope um, this is going to work like that as well today. So please don't be shy if you have any question for one of our speakers or any feedback, um, just uh, post it in this little uh, double speech bubble that you find um, on the bottom menu of your screen. Uh, it says Q&A. Um, so whenever um, your question pops up, just send it there or submit it there. And we will have, after every talk, we will have a 10 minutes Q&A session uh, where we will try to address your question. Um, okay, also because it came up yesterday uh, several times, uh, we will not uh, send out the presentations, but uh, the whole symposium is being recorded. So we will um, upload the talks uh, to the YouTube channel of the Initiative for Coffee and Climate after the event. And yeah, presumably in the next week, um, we will send the link to you, to everyone who has registered so that you can watch it there or rewatch it. Okay, so um, I think then we can just start with our first uh, topic, our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is uh, Viktor Komakech. Viktor, there are you. Hi, Viktor, how are you doing? <laughs> Oh, 
Victor, your video just stopped. Can you say something? Hi. Hi, hi, Annika. Hi, everyone. Now it's working. Perfect. Hi. <laughs> yeah, Victor is Hello. a climate change coordinator yeah. <laughs> at the Hans R. Neumann Stiftung in Uganda. And Victor holds a degree um, in natural resources management, and he has more than 20 years of experience working uh, with smallholder farmers in the fields of agriculture, uh, in climate change, livelihood improvement, agroforestry, and sustainable energy, among others. And um, yeah, today he's going to present us the pivotal role of stakeholder engagement in development programs and the challenges that arise when stakeholders are sidelined. Um, here's Victor Komakesh with his uh, talk, uh, Participatory Monitoring and Evaluation, Transforming Challenges into Sustainable Development Successes. Enjoy. Um, thank you, Annika, uh, for the introductions. Um, I was mentioning that um, today I will be talking to you about participatory monitoring and evaluation, sharing from our experience um, here in Uganda in one of the projects um, um, where we implemented the participatory monitoring and evaluation um, approach, that is the initiative for coffee and climate phase three, um, which we implemented um, uh, between November 2020 and December 2023. Um, in three districts in central Uganda, targeting 5,000 smallholder coffee farming um, households. Um, I was also mentioning that, uh, of course, uh, conventional uh, monitoring and evaluation practices are not really that bad. And uh, of course, um, they are good, but they also have their own pitfalls, um, their own shortcomings. Um, for example, um, I was mentioning that uh, there is a big assumption that M&E is complex and technical and no, can only be done by experts. Um, and in most cases, we have seen in conventional M&E top-down um, approaches. You know, you develop the tools, you develop everything, and then you just come down and collect the data and go away. So it is a bit of top-down approach. Um, and in some cases, results are also not used to improve project implementations. So um, it is mostly, you know, for donor reporting. After analyzing the data report to the donor, don't even get back to the farmer to present, you know, um, the findings. Um, yeah. And uh, in most cases, we have also seen lack of trust in M&E results um, by the beneficiaries and the implementing teams. Um, and we have also been doing you know, a lot of M&E, collecting a lot of quantitative information and nothing um, qualitative. And uh, we have been using stakeholders more like, uh, you know, collecting um, sources of information, but not as, uh, you know, stakeholders in the M&E process. Um, so as uh, um, HRNS in Uganda, we decided that we need to uh, change this, um, um, this uh, kind of um, um, approach. So what we did, we introduced uh, and piloted, of course, the participatory monitoring and evaluation. And this is what comes with it. Tell me and I will forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I will understand. Next slide. Yeah, so um, the question is, what is uh, participatory monitoring and evaluation? So we say PM and E is a process uh, through which stakeholders at various levels engage in uh, monitoring and evaluation of a particular project program, they share control over the content, the process, and the results of the activity, and engage in taking or identifying corrective actions. Um, pm and &E also focuses on active engagement of uh, primary key stakeholders of the projects. And of course, these primary stakeholders, depending on the project, could be the end users of the project, goods and services, intermediary organizations, um, private sector, government staff at uh, different levels. Next slide. Yeah, so why the PM and E? Um, yeah, um, we have been using the PM and E to promote self assessment of the level of adoption of pro different project um, interventions. Um, we also um, use M and E to ensure that local people are active participants in the M&E process, but not just sources of information 
as I mentioned earlier. Um, also to be able to promote collective learning um, of the uh, different project stakeholders, um, build stakeholder capacity in conducting own assessments. Um, even if projects come to an end for sustainability purposes, uh, stakeholders can continue to do their own assessments. Um, to also promote ownership and trust in M&E processes and results, and also to ensure collective identification of key gaps uh, in adoption and collectively agree um, on appropriate um, actions. Next slide, please. So um, our participatory M&E actually targeted uh, three categories. One, uh, the farmer trainers. As uh, HRNS, we uh, normally train farmer trainers whom we call cooperative extensionists. Um, and also cooperative leaders. These are farmer organizational leaders, um, especially those that participate in our training, uh, training of trainers. Um, we believe that, um, you know, before you go to advise another person, you yourself should have adopted um, the best practices on your own farm. So um, farmer trainers, cooperative leaders, they must be exemplary to the other farmers. And so um, we also include them as part of the PM and E process. Um, we also had a second category, youth couple households hosting technology demonstrations. Um, all our demonstration plots, our demonstration, um, yeah, demonstrations of different technologies, practices are actually hosted by youth couples. So these youth couples, um, we didn't want to see that the, the, the implementation actually ends on the demonstration plot. But this is something that is also replicated in other parts of their farm so, uh, because people go there to study people go there to learn you know and so they shouldn't only see things in the demo they should see them replicated on other parts of their farms so they are the second category of the targets and then we also look at farming households in their respective farmer groups um, we work through the farmer field school um, approach so who is involved when we are conducting this uh, participatory monitoring and evaluation? So as I already mentioned, the cooperative leaders uh, are involved, the farmer trainers, the ones I was calling the cooperative extensionists. Uh, um, yeah, these are volunteer farmer trainers. So we train them and then they in turn are responsible um, for training farmers in the respective farmer field schools um, with technical backstopping from uh, the staff. So we also involve intermediary organizations sometimes, um, yeah, private sector, businesses, government staff, HRNA staff, um, sector government staff. I, I mean, later, of course, taking a key role, especially when we are talking about farmer trainers and cooperative leaders. But when it comes to the farmers themselves, um, like the farmer field schools, um, the farmer field schools um, leadership and the farmers themselves take the key um, responsibilities. Next slide. Yeah, so what are the steps that we normally take? Um, the first step is uh, planning. You need to plan very well the PM and, and E process and also determine the objectives. Why are you doing the participatory monitoring and evaluation? And what are the indicators that you are going to monitor? Then the second step, you do the data gathering. Um, then you analyze the data. And in the fourth step, um, you share the information and of course, you define actions that need to be taken. Next slide. Yeah, so in the planning process, I will go uh, talking about each of the different steps. So in the planning process, one of the key things that we require is the PM and E tool. What tool are you going to use um, when you are collecting data? So um, as HRNS, uh, we developed the tool initially and then we presented, discussed, and agreed upon this with different relevant stakeholders, including the farmer, farmers and farmer representatives. So we presented the tool based on um, you know, um, what are the key topics that we train um, under this project and what do we want to monitor um, in this case. Um, so the tool was um, just, I, I would say, uh, mutually agreed upon participatorily with all the different stakeholders. Um, of course, also key performance indicators were collectively agreed upon. Um, and of course, in some instances, the tool had to be adjusted, of course, to take care of farmers' concerns. Um, of course, there were issues uh, including um, socioeconomic questions because they were saying it's not only coffee, you know, 
we also need to look at health, hygiene, and sanitation in the household. Because however good the coffee, however good the crops you have, if you are always falling sick, then definitely most of the income from the coffee or from the other uh, enterprises that you have on farm will be going, you know, to take care of medication other than improving the livelihoods of the household. So these were suggestions that came from the farmers themselves. And then they also uh, to include um, gender um, inclusiveness um, as something that we could as well monitor. And uh, of course, the tool initially was in English, but they said, no, we need to simplify this and also translate um, to a local language that everybody can understand um, and for ease of use, especially by the farmers. Um, of course, the tool is both digitalized and ca can be used as well as a, as a hard copy. So what are the topics that we normally assess in the participatory monitoring and evaluation? So we um, assess good agronomic practices, um, we assess climate smart practices, safe use and handling of agrochemicals. We assess record keeping. We assess household energy saving technologies, water harvesting and storage um, yeah, um, technologies. Um, we also check membership in saving groups. And then we look at uh, hygiene and sanitation and gender inclusiveness. Recently, we are also including food security as part of the topics that will be assessed um, going forward. Next slide. Yeah, so in data gathering, so this is done normally on a quarterly basis. So the PM and E participants converge at a particular, particular location where the PM and E exercise is to take place. And the day's program is normally agreed upon. The PM and T e tool is, um, and the process is also reviewed during this time. So the team sits down, come together, sit down and agree, of course, um, where they want to conduct the PM and E process um, and also uh, yeah, agree on the day's program. So a briefing is done when they move to the households that were selected. Um, the households are normally randomly selected. So the, the briefing is done with the entire household whose farm is to be assessed, clearly explaining the PM and E objectives and the process. So we are not only looking at the household head in this case, we are bringing together the entire household and we sit together with them and we discuss um, what this is all about. Um, why are we doing this? And what will the process involve? Then the PM and E team um, uh, divides itself. They divide themselves into smaller groups with each group assigned to closely observe adoption of a particular um, practice. So like we, I told you the, the topics that we assess. So maybe one group is looking at um, a, a good agricultural practices, adoption on the farm. They're looking at climate smart practices. There's another team that's looking at uh, gender. There's another team that's looking at, uh, you know, um, safe use and handling of agrochemicals. So depending on the number of participants available, um, that's the way it's um, organized. Then this team moves through the farm. They go through the farm, you know, uh, in their subgroups. Uh, and then in this case, each of the subgroups is noticing, is taking note of what is going on on the farm, you know, in terms of the different topics that they are responsible for. How is the adoption? What is the level of adoption? Are they doing it the right way? Have they adopted it anyway? You know? So yeah, next slide, please. So after they have done the data collection, then the team converges, they come together and then they collectively agree and award scores based on the findings. So group one will report that this is what um, we found out and these are the scores that we are giving um, to this household. So they give the scores um, and then the results from each farm is immediately presented and discussed with the household members and action points and timelines for uh, implementation of agreed actions are agreed upon. So you sit together with the farm, uh, the, the, the members of the household and you discuss, you say from the findings, these are the findings and um, yeah, these are the results. And then you discuss with the, the household, what are the action points? Um, that needs to be taken to, for this, um, especially where there are gaps, where there's low adoption, you know, how and when can they be, you know, implemented. So in case the household mentions uh, capacity as being a gap, oh, we don't know how to do this. We, so the group immediately provides own spot capacity building for this household. Um, yeah. And then uh, on an annual basis, HRNS 
uh, yeah, um, results, of course, from randomly selected farms that have been assessed. Normally, you know, it's a large number. So what HRNS does now is to really randomly select farms, you know, select results from certain farms. Normally, we have been doing four farms per cooperative. We just randomly pick the results, and these are consolidated and further analyzed, and it's presented to a bigger team of stakeholders. Next slide. Yeah. So then um, after that, uh, focus group discussions are organized um, with farmers whose farms were assessed to present and discuss, you know, the broader consolidated results of the entire PM and E exercise uh, during that period. So we organize focus group discussions with selected farmers, uh, these four farmers that I'm talking about per cooperative. And then here, the results are further discussed because uh, the other side, we are mostly getting quantitative um, information. But here we discuss the results deeper, really to get you know an in-depth understanding of the beneficiary perspective of the results. Why is it like this? You know, why are we not adopting this practice? Why is this one low? You know, for example, why are we scoring high on this? Um, um, and then together with the team, we corrective actions are agreed upon. So we discuss with them now what can we do to make sure that um, there's improvement. And then, of course, um, the corrective actions um, can be both for HRNS and can also be for the beneficiaries. Um, because in this case, we are not only looking maybe at the practices, but the farmers can tell you we are not adopting this because the methodology that you are using to train us is not you know, so good. So then we are able to you know, take that up and say, yeah, we need to correct this. We need to improve on this. But there are actions that need to be taken by the beneficiaries as well. And these are agreed upon, and then we agree on timelines, and then everybody goes to do um, what they are supposed to do. And this, um, these corrective actions, of course, as I said, can be practices promoted, or even looking at the approaches um, that we use, so that they become more farmer friendly and more acceptable um, to the communities that we work with. So the cycle is repeated, you know, um, every quarter it is done, and then for HRNS annually, the team. Um, um, select some, some results and be able to analyze them. And then the process um, is cyclic again. Next slide. Actually, something that I should mention is that by the end of the year, ideally all the farmers um, should be assessed using this uh, methodology, depending on their uh, farm appeal schools that they come from, about 25 to 30 farmers. So every quarter they do like 10, 10, by the end of the year, all the farmers are assessed and all the farms visited. So maybe just to share with you a few of the results that came out. Next slide. Yeah, so we can see the percentage, adop percentage adoption of good agricultural practices, as well as climate smart practices among cooperative extensionists and leaders. These are the farmer trainers and the leaders. So we can see uh, this was done for 47 farmer trainers and 36 leaders of farmer organizations. Um, they were assessed, uh, the last assessment was in November, 2023, and the results were compared to assessment that was done in November, 2022. So here we can see um, the levels of adoption of the different um, agronomic practices as well as climate smart practices. And we can see that over the time, there was an increase, um, yeah, significantly of over 93%, you know, of the farmers showing um, improvement. I'll not go into the details of each. Uh -huh, next slide. Yeah, so I also said we assess youth demo hosts couples. So um, we can see the results from also assessments that were conducted in November 2022 and 2023, respectively. You can see the improvements as well. That actually here we have 100% um, improvements. Next slide. Yeah, so among the farmer field school members, we had uh, three assessments, November 2021, uh, 2022, and 2023, respectively. And when we compared the results um, from the three different assessments, um, we can see that there is also, uh, on average, over 93% of members showing improvement in this case. Next slide. 
Yeah, so what are our learnings in this case? Um, the positives. Um, this approach is really flexible, I should say, and can be adopted for use in different contexts. So whether you are in uh, health, whether you are in, um, you know, um, whatever sector you're in, you can be able to adopt this uh, methodology and uh, use it accordingly. Um, it increases reliability and trust in the M&E results because it's done by the farmers themselves. It's done by the stakeholders themselves. No moving from farm to farm. In that case, they, they, they have seen it. And actually the households uh, say, yes, we agree with this. This is what exactly is on our farm. So there's a lot of reliability and trust in the M&E results um, in this case. It also provides an opportunity to receive immediate feedback and ideas for corrective actions. As I mentioned, after visiting a farm, sit together with the family, and they, they are able to discuss, you know, why is this happening like this? This are the, So corrective actions, trainings are provided, on-spot trainings, in this case, uh, for corrective actions. It also strengthens ownership of the data, results, and the project, I should say. So you find, you know, about a particular project, everybody is saying, yes, um, what you're presenting is the correct thing, you know? So there's ownership, um, the farmers feel they own the results, they, they, they take, you know, uh, they take credit where it is due, they, they take the blame also where it is due, and they know each one of us has a role to play um, to make the results better. So it acts as a complementary approach to our routine m and &E assessments. We have not thrown away the m and &E assessments, the conventional, we still use them. And actually, um, we have been trying to compare also to see um, what, what do this mean when we have uh, the, the PM and E and the conventional P, uh, but, uh, monitoring and evaluation, what do the results tell us? And I must tell you, there is a lot of similarity as I will uh, present in the next uh, points. So it increases the motivation of stakeholders to collectively learn and to adopt interventions. One of the things that I've seen is that of course, sometimes um, when farmers here, of course, their colleagues are coming to their farm you know, from different parts of the village, everybody is coming to see their farm and uh, how they have uh, implemented on their farm. There's always, you know, enthusiasm, there's motivation. The farmers get to work to make sure that, you know, when their colleagues come, they are not, you know, ashamed, but I mean, uh, they have been able to do the best that they can on their farms. So it enhances social cohesion in the community. When you are part of these discussions, you see how people are interacting, you know, so there's a really, really a lot of social cohesion that comes with this. And also, you know, the relationship with, between different stakeholders, you know, sometimes not only the farmers alone, but how are they related to, with the staff? How are they relating with uh, maybe the government, um, agriculture officers? So you find there's that cohesion and there's free communication um, um, as a result of these engagements. And of course, as I mentioned, similar results have been obtained from both the conventional M and E surveys and the PM and E tools. And this really shows the objectivity of the farmers and other stakeholders in, during the PM and E exercise. Next slide, please. Yeah, so um, the limitations. Of course, it needs a skilled facilitator. Um, that one is very, very key. So in the beginning as HRNS, we normally take uh, responsibility as we build the capacity of these farmers and other stakeholders to take on, um, um, on this PM and E exercise. So um, yeah, at the end of it all, we have to handle the mantle to the communities. After one or two MPM and E exercises, we hand it over. And then we technically backstop to see that they are doing the right thing. So it really needs a skilled facilitator. Otherwise, um, the exercise might not move well. Can also be dominated by strong voices. So you find one or two people, everybody, I mean, are the ones that are speaking, you know, all the time. They are the ones that want to contribute. They are the ones that you know um, want to give ideas. You know, are the ones that want to train. So, as a skilled facilitator, you should be a participant um, to have a voice. Um, it's also time-consuming, um, I should say, in some instances, and it can also be expensive um, to implement. Next slide. Yeah. So, in terms of outlook. Um, we have presented our uh, pilot results um, in the bigger HRNS team. And uh, actually we have plans to scale this up almost in all the projects that we implement. Um, and of course, we are also using this a similar approach 
um, to assess the performance of our pharma organizations using the organizational development uh, scorecard. Um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, thank you. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, maybe you can try and switch on your camera now because uh, the sound was very good afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Victor, thank you so much for sharing this uh, approach. I think, yeah, you mentioned the top down approach and how farmers are not included and in the MD process were sometimes not even re receiving the findings so that this is like a real barrier to successful implementation and I think uh, including the stakeholders who are affected that should normally go without saying so I think it's really great that you are implementing this approach in Uganda and that there are even plans to scale it uh, on a global level um, so um, we you. have a question yeah <laughs> We have a question here already from the audience, uh, I think several even, which is great. Um, you mentioned some limitations already to the approach, uh, but I think the question nevertheless has uh, touches a bit of still another aspect. So it is, uh, what is your view on PM and E in relation to independent external evaluation? PM and E obviously has advantages, but is there a risk of biased results? If so, how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, thank you very much for that question. Um, as I mentioned um, that, um, of course the, the conventional PR, I mean the uh, M and E is still, you know, <laughs> a good approach. Um, and um, of course, in this case, we are also trying to, 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 to really see, um, if the PM and E and the other conventional um, monitoring and evaluation really align in a way. So um, in terms of the biases, you know, this, the, the farmers are coming from different places. They're coming from different places. And sometimes we're also engaging our staff can be there. The other stakeholders that are also there. So when they are dividing themselves, it's not only, you know, um, it's, it's a group of people. It's not one or two people. But it's because the PM and E exercise is normally conducted by, you know, they are almost like uh, 20 members that are coming onto the farm. So uh, dividing these groups into five, five, you know, it's 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 really really difficult um, um, for them to to be biased in that case, including other stakeholders. So that's the way in which we also try to you know address these uh, issues of bias. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. Um... Okay, I think, uh, yeah, this question that just came in, you have basically just answered it. How big is the PMNE group? Is the farmer sometimes concerned about a big group going around? But I think, <laughs> yeah, you just yeah. said it. Yeah, I just said it, sure. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I still have... Um, Another question is, uh, you also mentioned that this approach can basically be scaled also into other sectors that it's uh, very um, universal in a way. Um, so I'm wondering if another organization like very hands on uh, would like to implement such a participatory approach in their project. Um, what would be first steps and what would maybe be your suggestion what really needs to be considered there. Um, of course, um, you cannot take the approach exactly as we have mentioned it into <laughs> another project, maybe in a different context. So you need to understand your context. What is the, is the context in which you're working? Who are your um, stakeholders in this case? So um, there needs to be proper planning. Um, that's the first step to really accept that this can be possible. In the beginning, it might be a bit difficult. Um, but as you go along, you know, it gets quite easy and you really like the process. Um, so the planning, you need to sit down with the different, um, your m and &E team and the different stakeholders, uh, representatives, and agree that this could be the way to go. And once you have agreed on that, then you need to design a proper m and &E system, the tools that you are going to use, the process that you are going to take, who is going to be involved in this case. So the planning process is quite um, key 
in all this. And then, of course, um, the data collection process, how it's, is it going to be done? Who is going to be involved? All that needs to be put into consideration. Um, what tools are you going to use to analyze this information? Um, and then, of course, how are you going to act on the M and E findings? All these are things that you need to have um, at the back of your mind. And uh, of course, how are you going to reflect on the effectiveness of the system um, in order to improve the next cycle of your implementation process? So it's about really sitting down with your different stakeholders and agreeing that this is the direction you want to take. And then, of course, doing proper planning um, and designing the M and E process um, in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way I could respond. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Uh, there are no more questions from the audience. And yeah, Victor, um, thank you so much for, for giving these insights, for uh, responding to the questions. It was very interesting. And yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Annika. And thank mm -hmm. you, everyone. Okay. All the best as you implement the PM&D process. Yeah, and I'm sure if somebody has questions, maybe they can also reach out to you. <laughs> yeah, they can also reach out to us. And, and if you need further information, if you need further guidance, uh, probably you can still reach out to HRNS. We can see how to support you and your organization to implement this. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Victor. <laughs> okay, that was our talk about uh, the participatory approach. Our next talk is also uh, going to be about participation uh, in a way, uh, because it's about participation of women in decision making. It's about equal rights and responsibilities, and it's about gender equality. And uh, the, the topic or the title of the next uh, talk is how imbalanced is your approach? What we miss out when we don't include women in climate action. It's going to be held by Eutropia Nido. Eutropia, are you with us? Hi, Utopia. <laughs> Hi, I'm here. You're, you're there. You're connecting from Tanzania, am I right? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> okay, just to introduce you, um, uh, Utopia is a, a rural economist loca located in Tanzania. Uh, she specialized on policy analysis and program development. And uh, she works with organizations to analyze causes, effects, and challenges posed by climate change and develop solutions with a gender perspective. And um, yeah, she's presenting the situation today uh, of gender equality or inequality respectively in East Africa to us today. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Anika, for the introduction and also the opportunity that I'm part of this process. And hi, everyone. So today I was given this topic just to uh generate some thoughts and also ideas for more brainstorming and discussion the idea first was posed as how imbalance is your approach and then we reflect on what we miss when we don't include women in climate action so i decided that uh, i will start by um asking whether women are really affected by climate change. And then I will discuss, next slide, I will discuss uh, about um, what, what we miss when we, we don't include women. And then I will also discuss the challenges of uh, including women in uh, processes of uh, deciding and uh, implementing climate change. Next slide, please. So next, because I've introduced this one. So I will start with, uh, why do we view that women are severely affected by climate change? So that was my first question to reflect upon. So next. And uh, it, is, it is true and it is a fact that climate change impact affects everyone in the society but it's not equally due to various reasons. And I will discuss few reasons here. 
First of all, I looked at differentials in gender roles and responsibilities, also on the accessibility and control over resources, power and influence in decision making, which are caused by historical and structural inequalities. All these differentials, they affect or they give different magnitude on how men and women or other segments of the societies are affected. And I picked one. I said, let me look at the gender roles and responsibilities. And you find that women, they have a role of uh, food and income in secu uh, security in the household. They have to make sure that there is available fuel and water resources. All these are affected by climate change. So when we talk about climate change, then it is very clear that they will be very much affected because there are roles which have been allocated to them, uh, which they define uh, the women in the society, they are affected by uh, climate change severely. When you talk about food and when there is no income in the household, even the women suffers more. But we will see because I will also talk about intersectionality, which are also factors to be considered. But at least for the gender dimension, we find that women are really affected by climate change. Next. Uh, despite that they don't own or have great control over resources, they are main users of the resources in fulfilling their roles and responsibilities. You can, uh, it is very clear that they need lunch to, uh, produce food, they need water in the household, they need fuel, wood. All these are natural resources which are affected by uh, climate change. So we are saying they are main users. And this is the reason that because these resources are affected by climate change, it is also important to include women or it is important to consider that they are severely affected by climate change. Next. Uh, when we talk about livelihood in uh, East Africa, most of our livelihood depend on agriculture, natural resources, and other land-based activities, but also the informal economy, where women are key players. So if we are talking about promoting livelihood, uh, then we can not uh, avoid talking about women being affected by climate change because they, have, they are heavily dependent on uh, agriculture. They are heavily dependent on natural resources and also other land-based activities in the informal economy. So in this regard, we can uh, conclude generally that we need to, uh, to involve women in determining measures to address climate change effect and impact. So that was the first part where I was reflecting on why we think that women are affected by climate change. Next, we are now moving to, uh, if women are not included in climate change actions, in deliberations or decision-making, or in uh, implementation, what will be the effect? And uh, one I said, chances that solutions are not, uh, are not gender sensitive, or solutions will be biased. So you find that sometimes solutions come for uh, specific gender roles and not other roles. So it is because the other gender was not represented in decision-making. So if the solutions are not addressing different responsibilities, they are not uh, addressing needs and aspirations of uh, women, we will not be surprised that there was a, a problem in uh, making that decision because those needs or aspirations were not addressed. So if we don't include uh, women, then we will find that the needs and the aspirations are not covered in the solutions which are being uh, introduced or are being implemented. Second, it is also likely that uh, solutions to climate change or mitigation measures will not be appropriate and sustainable because 
uh, they will come with uh, maybe technology, they will come with the uh, aspect of uh, affordability and providing uh, women with better livelihood prospects. So if we, we miss that, or if we don't include women, we will see that these solutions will come without the feasibility on their technology affordability. And I was looking at what uh, like uh, my colleague uh, who has just uh, on the first presentation, he presented different uh, technologies or techniques they are using, shade, mulching, erosion control, uh, correct intercropping. So I said, okay, if we have these as uh, solutions to climate change, he called them climate change actions. So if these are climate change act actions, I look at the technology which is being used. Is it affordable? Is it feasible for women? Does it pre uh, provide women a better livelihood and prospects? Does it improve our uh, opportunities or transforming their lives? And uh, from yesterday, because I also participated in uh, yesterday's presentation, I find that like shade, when we talk about shade, it means if we are pruning, it means women will get some fire, firewood. And when we are doing uh, correct intercropping, if we involve women, it will improve their livelihood if we talk about also intercropping with uh, food uh, products or food crops, which will improve uh, food security in the household. So the solutions will, will be uh, more appropriate and sustainable if they address on and they improve opportunities for, for women. So uh, from yesterday, it gives prospects when we see that intercropping is also talking about food crops like cassava, maize, which are important also to fulfill the roles of women. But if we don't involve women, we will find that mostly people uh, those who are making decisions, they will also consider about their roles. And sometimes it uh, leans on the income, 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 and they forget about food security. So I, I was happy when I was listening to uh, different measures which have been taken, that at least I see that uh, women are going to benefit from what uh, is being introduced and implemented in various uh, parts of the world. Next. Uh, if we, 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 we have, uh, we, we exclude women, it means there will be inadequate coping mechanism for women. Like I said, uh, if we are including women, when we talk about these different uh, measures like shedding, mulching, erosion control, and cor uh, correct intercropping, then it means it gives some way that women have coping mechanism in some aspects where they are responsible like food. But also we are looking at uh, measures which will not add more work to, to women, which will not uh, expose them to danger, which will make them uh participate in other economic activities because they want to diversify so if we 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 exclude them it means there will be inadequate coping mechanism for women and this increases our, our vulnerability and inequality therefore placing a greater risk of experience of experiencing detrimental climate impacts and uh, I just gave some examples that we will eat less because the food security, food insecurity will increase. We'll walk long distances. I was thinking about uh, if coffee, we are using uh, the wet method where we are saying, okay, the coffee can go to the cooperatives. I know that in most cases, when there is no uh, transport facilities, women will be involved to, to carry coffee on their heads to the cooperative. And if the cooperative, the machine is very far, then it means that is a, a, an extra job to women. 
And then if we are using wet material, we need a uh, wet method, we, we, we need water. So we have to think of what technologies will help women uh, in terms of uh, supplying water in the household. So I expect that uh, it is not only talking about, uh, yes, we can take coffee to the uh, machines, but we can also talk about how to get water because this uh, coffee will need water to be uh, uh, fermented, also to be washed. So I think those are the things we expect that we give women more coping mechanism uh, so that they will participate in the household activities but they will also be relieved from uh, the things which they were, which was heavy on their shoulder. So sometimes when there is no food in the household or they have to walk long distances, there is, uh, they are emotionally affected. They are prone to violence if they have to walk long distances or sometimes water, when water is, uh, there is shortage of water, they have uh, to work. Uh, very early to wake up early in the morning uh, to go for water or maybe come late or uh, when they are collecting firewood and so on. So in that case, I said they will not be able to participate also in the economic activities because they need to diversify income activities in the household and there will be poverty. And we also expect GBV and high mobility for women if uh, all these are not taken care of. So next slide, uh, we will miss the opportunity of utilizing the invaluable knowledge because women, they have been involved in using uh, natural resources and they are very, they, they have participated in uh, utilizing and also conserving uh, natural resources. So we will miss their expertise and also knowledge because they have uh, been part of building the re re resilience to climate change, which we see now. Uh, most of us we have witnessed in our households where even the intercropping is also considering when they, they, the women are given opportunity to suggest what crops they will say, oh, we have to intercrop this and this. If we miss this, then we'll get this. So they have been there. And uh, if we don't involve them, it means we are sidelining this knowledge and the expertise. And there are a lot of other issues like uh, well, when they are pruning the firewood, I know that women, they have their own way of storing uh, the, the firewood. So if we, we don't involve them, and then we suggest that when we, we prune, we just crush and then we sell it to the uh, paper making uh, factories. It means we are giving this opportunity away that women are also getting a firewood. So we have to measure uh, the options and they have to be there to decide which options will give them more relief and more opportunities because even crushing it into something else, it can benefit women if they can assess the money which will be gained from that uh, uh, move. But if that move gives only income to men and uh, denies women the firewood, then I think we are going back to where we are saying they, they, they will not have uh, good coping mechanisms. And, uh, the other one, the last one I thought was, uh, it will increase, if we are not including them, it will increase gender inequality and vulnerability. And then it will be very far away from reaching the SDGs. Because if you look at the SDGs, they are talking about food insecurity, they are talking about health, they are talking about education for girls, they are talking about poverty and GBV. And we have seen that if we are not including women, then it means we are very far from these SDGs. So it is very important that they are included in decision making, but also in the actions, in the implementation of these actions. Next. Our 
presentation, my presentation now is going to discuss about the challenges in trying to integrate women in addressing climate change. And uh, the challenges which we have is that systems and power structures that deepen gender inequalities are still uh, existing. In this regard, there is lack of gender dimension in key frameworks and policies. If you look at main policies, uh, you find that there are some gaps and uh, some of the gaps are very serious. And it is because the system and the power structures, they, they have not given a uh, full uh, gender dimension analysis and uh, integration of the issues. So once the system and power structure is not changed, then it means it will be very challenging. My colleagues will, uh, from East Africa, they will agree with me that even where we have made an attempt to have 30% women representatives in the, uh, our parliament or in other decision-making structures, because even the committees, that quota is given to women, but we still have a, a uh, problems of uh, women taking charge or even participating meaning, meaningfully. Uh, and it is because of power relations and uh, power structures which will be set in the, com uh, the committees or in the parliament, you see that women are not uh, that prominent or that powerful in those structures. But uh, I, I promise that uh, I will also discuss about inter intersectionality. And uh, I think it is important to know that there are many other factors which are important in defining the identities. Some of them, they are relevant also because I'm, I'm not defined only as a woman. I'm also defined by other factors like, uh, am I educated or not educated? What is my social economic status in the community? Uh, what is my position, for example, in the community or in uh, the government or in other areas? Where am I working? So there are a lot of other factors which are not considered in promoting gender equality, and they are very important. So this is a topic which we say that if they are not uh, considered, various initiatives have less impact. And in some cases, they worsen the situation for some most disadvantaged women. So I consider gender and ethnicity, gender rural educated. I remember one of the activities which I did for HNRS Tanzania. We had uh, an opportunity of uh, analyzing uh, participation of young people. How are they going to participate or what are the opportunities and the aspirations in uh, uh, education and vocational training in particular? And you find that there are dif dif differences between rural and uh, urban. And those who are at a uh, level of uh, university and those who are at primary school level. So, there are a lot of other factors to consider when we are thinking of uh, uh, gender equality or gender equity. So I said quite often these factors are not considered in the efforts of uh, promoting gender equality. So I was very happy in this exercise that we looked at uh, the differentials between uh, rural and urban uh, youth we also looked about north and south, so in geographical differences, and that considers, we didn't go into details on uh, considering the ethnicity, considering uh, maybe uh, they are close to the borders or not close to the borders, but it was somehow coming that if you consider those who are close to the border, they have more exposure, but sometimes the exposure also has gone to the extent that they are they are in a more risk of uh, losing them because they are exposed to so many social environments which they can cope they cannot cope with. So there are those issues which we have to consider when we are looking at gender issues and if we want to 
bring uh, gender equity. And also there is an aspect of single or married or gender and disability. And when we talk about single uh, household, single-headed households, we know the impact which they, they feel because they are not owning resources. And when they are ridiculed in the society, they have so many uh, names and a lot of things. So all these factors are important if we want to promote gender equality. Next. Uh, the other factor which I considered was that uh, there is limited participation of women in planning and decision-making processes. Like I said, women are not adequately represented. If we are talking about the numbers, we can say 30% versus 70 is also like uh, uh, there is a big gap, but also the 30% the which is there they have a lot of other uh, challenges in their participation. I have not observed our parliament, but I can say sometimes I think there are some topics which I feel that women were not given opportunity to contribute, or maybe they did not ask for that opportunity, I don't know. But there are some topics you bite your finger and say, I wish the uh, female parliamentarians, they would have said something here, but you don't see it coming. But sometimes it's both, uh, because we lack information. Sometimes we don't get the information adequately or we don't seek it or we don't have access to it. And it depends. In rural areas, you find that a young man, when they get money because they are only looking at themselves, not something else or anything else in the community. They can go and buy a, 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 a what is it, a, a advanced mobile phone where they can access information, information. But female youth, they have a lot of others, other uh, issues to consider. First of all, is their own uh, personal needs as female, uh, but also they are looking at the households. Sometimes they have children and they are just looking after their children on their own, while men, their first priority will be a phone. For a youth uh, female, the first priority will be a child, for example. So we don't access information which is relevant for decision making. And sometimes when you go to the meetings, you find that women are silent, they don't say anything. It's not because they don't, they like, it's because they don't have that information. And sometimes the information is not timely uh, accessed or reached. And sometimes it is also uh, the places where the information is, uh, is shared. Sometimes the information or decisions are made in bars. So where women will not be there because they are at home taking care of the children. So we are limited in terms of uh, taking part in decision-making processes. You will find that even in big decisions, lobbying and uh, whatever is made outside the mainstream. So we miss that opportunity because we will not be there. But sometimes it's timing of the events and place of events, which I have discussed sometimes, like uh, when they are invited for a meeting, is taking them away from home and they have someone who has to make decision uh, whether they should go or not. And it's not only husbands, it's also uh, children, because if you have to take care of children and elderly in the family, then you don't have an option. But finally, the last uh, factor I considered as a challenge was lack of gender disaggregated data. So, so far, there is no uh, concrete evidence of how climate change affects or in fact uh, impacts vary between men and women because uh, data is not collected, uh, is not disaggregated. So we, we just say based on some aspects, but we don't have data as such. So I would say that this is a very big challenge 
and uh, some studies have to be included. Thank you. That is the end. So I would say if you are, you are, approach is in balance, then you are missing a lot of aspects and you are you are not uh, geared towards uh, uh, contributing to sustainable development goals. Thank you so much, Eutropia, also for these closing words. <laughs> um, we have indeed a, a question coming in and still a few minutes left until the next speaker. Um, so I think part of the uh, question was already a bit tackled in the, the first part, but it's uh, so is gender and climate projects included enough? I guess that's basically what you said. It's, it's not the case. And if not, how to overcome that? I think what I see in uh, HNRS Tanzania, uh, they, they, there has been some good effort in uh, integrating or mainstreaming women in uh, coffee production. And uh, it's one of the projects where we see that there, is a, there was a specific intervention which took a household approach to make sure that they understand the dynamics in the household and also see what uh, decisions can be made by the household, but also giving some technical input. Like uh, my colleague was saying, the, the previous speaker, that when they do M&E in the household, there are some gaps which will be addressed uh, directly. But when I see the different actions which are being taken uh, by HNRS Uganda, which I also know that they are also taking uh, the same actions in Tanzania, I'm looking at and I'm curious later on to learn well, how they benefit from these actions. Mulching, erosion control, I would like to know how much women they are contributing in the labor which is needed but also on how much women are benefiting from coffee production in the household. So I can say if we want to, I think projects are trying, but we, because of the other challenges, sometimes it's not, and it's not si one size fits all. For HNRS uh, Tanzania, we learned that what is a challenge in the North is not a challenge in the Southern Tanzania. So I think projects are trying to make uh, different interventions in different regions accordingly. So, but it takes time. It's not like uh, all the problems will be uh, addressed uh, in one intervention. So I, I know that they have uh, started to take uh, measures and I have participated in uh, those projects. So I, at least I understand that some efforts are being made. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, efforts are being made. There are already some good examples. Um, yeah, but there's still there are still challenges, also location specific challenges, etc. So yeah. there's yeah. no one solution fits it all. Um, uh, yeah, I think um, we will have to continue now with the next speaker, unfortunately. <laughs> but thank you so much, Eutropia, for. For sharing your knowledge there. It was very yeah. valuable. And yeah, I hope you stay a bit for the next talks too. <laughs> okay. Yes, um, I will be around. Yes, I will be around. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Uh, so our next talk is about financing. Um, our guest is Elizabeth Teague. Uh, she's Senior Director, Climate Resilience at Root Capital. Hello, Elizabeth. <laughs> Welcome. Hello. Um, yeah, Elizabeth uh, states, climate action requires significant new investment by coffee farmers and supply chain partners. Yet less 2% of global climate finance goes to small scale agricultural supply chains. And over the last three years, Root Capital has been working to help close uh, this climate finance gap for smallholder coffee communities in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. 
And under Elizabeth's uh, leadership, the organization has deployed more than $250 million in climate finance to agricultural enterprises across uh, these continents since 2020. Um, Elizabeth Talks is, is going to be about investing in climate action with coffee communities, lessons learned from partnering with farmer elite businesses. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for taking the time today. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks so much to um, HRNS in particular for the invitation. Um, next slide, please. So for those who aren't familiar, Root Capital is an impact investor that provides financing and business training to agricultural enterprises in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Since our founding in 1999, we've lent almost $2 billion to more than 750 agricultural businesses. As an impact first investor, we go where other lenders don't. We finance businesses that fall into the missing middle, too big for microfinance, but too small or too risky for commercial lenders. In fact, over 90% of our loans go to businesses without access to similar financing from commercial lenders. And um, we work very closely in the coffee sector. Most of the businesses we work with are in fact coffee producer organizations. Last year, we financed 175 coffee enterprises, supporting over 400,000 smallholders across three continents. So as Annika mentioned today, I'm going to talk about climate finance for coffee producers why producers need climate financing, what they want to invest in, and some reflections from Root Capital's work to get climate finance into the hands of producer organizations. Next slide, please. I imagine everyone here today is well aware of the threats that climate change poses to the coffee sector, most importantly to the 12 million or so smallholders whose livelihoods depend on coffee. And of course, producers themselves live the reality of climate change every day. Whenever we speak with producer organizations, they mention climate action as a priority for their business and for their producer members. The quotes on the slide here speak to that reality in origins as distinct as Guatemala and Uganda. Because climate change is a reality today, of course we need investment today, yet we're not seeing enough investment in adaptation within coffee communities. As others have shared in this symposium, producers, producer organizations, and other supply chain actors generally aren't prepared for the new climate reality. Next slide, please. One reason is a lack of appropriate financing. Coffee producers unfortunately sit at the intersection of three massive financing gaps. First, there's a long standing gap in financing of any kind for smallholder, smallholder agriculture, which already runs into the billions of dollars a year. This is the financing gap that inspired Root Capital start 25 years ago and a gap that we're, we're still fighting to, to fill with other impact investors. Second, there's a new financing gap for climate action within smallholder supply chains. So data from the Climate Policy Initiative shown via the bar chart on the left of the slide indicates we need at least a seven-fold increase in climate financing for agri-food systems. And even more financing is needed for smallholders who receive less than 1% of global climate finance today. There was actually an update recently to the, the number that Annika shared and even less finance is flowing to smallholders than originally expected. And finally, there's a financing gap for climate adaptation, which receives much less attention than climate change mitigation or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Again, the Climate Policy Initiative indicates we need roughly a fourfold increase in adaptation financing in the Global South, as shown um, on the right of this slide. So starting in 2020, actually, if you can, sorry, stay on the previous slide, thank you. Um, starting in 2020, Root Capital set out to help close the climate finance gap for producer organizations and other farmer allied businesses. We wanted to design new climate finance products suited to the realities and aspirations of smallholder communities. And given the particular lack of adaptation funding, we wanted to focus on financing to help producer communities realize their vision for a climate resilient future. So to design our climate finance offering, we started at the intersection of producer needs and producer demand, asking two basic questions. What do producers need to invest in to adapt to climate change based on the science? And what do producers want to invest in based on their priorities for their farms, their households, and their communities? Next slide. To determine adaptation needs, we relied on research from several technical partners. First, the Alliance of Biodiversity, SEAT, 
Um, in particular, we used and continue to use their climate risk maps for coffee, which show where producers may need to adapt versus where they need, may need to transition to other crops or livelihood strategies altogether. Um, big thanks to our partner, Dr. Christian Bunn, who presented um, some of these maps in his other work yesterday at the symposium. Another key partner was the Coffee and Climate Initiative, of course, the sponsor of the symposium today, whose adaptation source book was instrumental in helping us identify potential adaptation solutions to respond to specific climate risks identified by our producer partners. The source book really helped us bring climate adaptation work down to the micro level to inform work on an individual farm. Next slide. Then we wanted to determine producers' adaptation demand. Again, what do producers actually want to invest in? So to do this, we spoke to over 100 producer organizations and producers themselves across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Mostly, we have these conversations through our business advisory services, for example, through hosting workshops for cooperative agronomic teams on site-specific climate risks and adaptation solutions, and hearing what investments they think are the most promising and the most urgent for their businesses. We also conducted a survey of our portfolio in which we asked businesses about the climate shocks they've experienced, the climate investments they've made to date, and the climate investments they'd like to make in the future. Producer organizations told us about rising temperatures, unstable precipitation patterns, and extreme weather events, and how these are all wreaking havoc on coffee harvests and incomes. We heard about catastrophic rains and mudslides in Peru and Uganda, excessive heat and drought in Nicaragua and Honduras, unseasonal rains disrupting flowering patterns or ruining drying coffee in Indonesia and Rwanda, and increasing pest and disease pressure basically everywhere. Producer organizations also told us that they're already investing in climate action to respond to these risks, especially in training for farmers on climate smart practices, distribution of climate smart inputs like organic compost, shade tree seedlings, or climate resilient coffee seedlings, and climate smart infrastructure, ranging from clean energy to reduce business emissions to actually quite simple equipment like covered drying beds to protect harvested coffee from the unseasonal rains. In the middle of the slide, for example, you can see um, an example of an uncovered drying bed that was leaving coffee exposed um, to the rains versus the improved cover drying infrastructure that producer organizations are, are investing in. Next slide, please. And I want to emphasize this point that coffee producers are already investing in climate action. Producer organizations that we finance reported investing on average $150,000 in climate action between 2019 and 2022. And remember, these are mostly small to medium sized cooperatives, maybe working with a few hundred to a few thousand farmers and businesses were dealing with COVID disruptions for much of this period. Next slide. But producer organizations also confirmed that lack of external financing limits their investment in climate action. Businesses said lack of appropriate external financing is their number one constraint to doing more. And when businesses did have access to external financing, they spent two to three times more on climate action. So based on what we learned about producer need and producer demand, we prioritized three areas for climate finance. Maintenance or introduction of climate smart farming practices, especially agroforestry and regenerative soil management practices. Expansion of business nurseries for climate resilient crops and trees. And installation of climate smart business infrastructure, such as clean energy, water efficient processing facilities, or some of the post harvest infrastructure I mentioned previously. We intentionally made these categories pretty broad to capture climate investment demand across our global portfolio. And we then work with each business to drill down on their specific needs in these areas. So how are we financing these priorities? Next slide. We start with financing to help producer organizations sustain and scale existing climate investments. For example, most of our borrowers work with farmers growing coffee under agroforestry conditions. We heard about the importance of agroforestry systems yesterday, um, but for those not familiar, agroforestry or farming with trees essentially is a widely recognized climate solution. It contributes to carbon drawdown, better soil health, and increased farmer income and resilience to shocks. We actually recently concluded a study with the Cool Farm Tool, Co-op Coffees, and other partners 
in which we calculated the carbon footprint of over 300 organic agroforestry coffee farms in Latin America. And we found that 62% of these farms operate at carbon negative at the farm level. That means that these farms sequester more carbon each year than they emit, a truly remarkable finding, especially when compared with full sun coffee systems. So our starting point with climate finance is identifying these climate champions in our portfolio, whom we call climate action leaders, and making sure these businesses have the capital needed to sustain and grow their climate solutions come what may. Because as we know in agriculture, climate solutions require ongoing, in many cases, annual investment. Farmers need to keep conserving shade trees. Businesses need to keep investing in organic inputs for farmers. It's not a given that businesses supporting climate solutions one year will be able to continue the next, especially given increasing climate shocks like back-to-back -back La Nina El Nino cycles these past two years. So a few years ago, we designed impact metrics to identify climate action leaders in our portfolio and set out to drive more working capital to them. One example is a coffee cooperative in Eastern Uganda in the Mount Elgon region. This cooperative supports around a, a, a thousand farmers in a region that has experienced 400 landslides in the past decade due to flash flood flooding, killing hundreds of people and displacing thousands. The co-op connects farmers to high value certified markets, provides agronomic training to members and supports reforestation efforts in the community. In 2020, Recapital provided the cooperative with its first ever loan of $150,000. Today, the co-op sales have increased five times to over $1 million annually, and our loans have quadrupled in size. The co-op now runs a major reforestation and agroforestry intensification campaign, working with producers to plant over 10 million trees to sequester carbon and reduce the risk of soil erosion, a major cause of landslides. So we see that growth and stability capital for businesses already pioneering climate solutions as critical, critical component of climate finance. But at the same time, we recognize more financing is needed to help businesses and producers invest in new climate solutions. Next slide. So to that end, we've also been designing and testing new climate finance products to help producer organizations invest in the priorities previously mentioned. In many cases, we start with small grants, usually $20,000 to help producer organizations test climate innovations without taking on a lot of risk. For example, we've used grants to finance the solar dryers I talked about previously in Central America and biodigesters in East Africa. So co-ops can generate, um, demonstrate proof of concept with their, their farmer members. From there, we look for opportunities where debt can help businesses make larger investments in climate action. Our primary focus to date has been loans for organic or low carbon fertilizers and soil amendments. Basically, we provide working capital loans to co-ops to get more fertilizers to producers during a cash flow pinch point, when producers need to invest in inputs and labor to secure a good crop, but usually have limited cash on hand from the last harvest. To make sure our loans support climate-friendly investments, we've established several climate eligibility criteria namely that financing goes only towards organic inputs or that co-ops present a low carbon fertilization plan that supports soil regeneration. I'm very happy to discuss this in more detail during the Q&A. Last year, we provided this kind of targeted climate finance to 20 coffee enterprises in Africa and Latin America. This year, we're continuing to increase finance for fertilizers and other climate investments in Central and South America and in East Africa. Over the last few years, we've provided more than 300 million in climate finance to agricultural enterprises, again, mostly to coffee producer organizations. And while we're very proud of this progress, we know it's nowhere near what's needed to close the climate finance gap for coffee producers. Of course, this is a global challenge requiring global action by everyone in the supply chain, not just producers. As Dr. Bunn mentioned yesterday, adaptation always goes beyond the farm. We can't leave producers to confront the climate crisis alone. So it's encouraging to see so many people here today who care about this challenge. And with that in mind, I wanted to offer up three reflections as we all think about how to build resilient coffee communities. Next slide, please. Um, first, look to producer organizations as key partners in scaling climate action. We know that many of the investments needed to prepare for climate change are at the farm level. 
but of course it's logistically challenging and expensive to engage thousands of individual producers, especially smallholders. Producer organizations play a critical role in scaling climate action by providing producers with the resources needed to spark adaptation investments, like technical assistance, access to inputs, access to markets, and financing. And perhaps most importantly, they represent the needs of producers. They ensure that local communities define their aspirations when it comes to adaptation and resilience. This is particularly important given the spatial variability of climate change impacts and the need for site-specific climate solutions that so many speakers have been, have been talking about over the last two days. Second, make climate action affordable for smallholder communities. I imagine this may sound self-evident, um, but when it comes to scaling climate finance, the conversation often focuses on the supply side. How much climate finance is flowing to producers? How much more funding is needed? Where is the funding coming from? And while this is of course critical, funders must not forget the demand side of the equation. What kind of finance do producers actually want? On what terms, at what price? And while the immediate threat of climate change is clear, the short-term economic returns of specific climate investments may not be. Certainly some climate investments pay for themselves by generating new revenue, perhaps in the form of increased coffee yield or quality, but it may take years to see results. Other adaptation investments um, generate value primarily by reducing future risk, for example, by reducing the risk of crop loss due to drought. But reduced risk, unfortunately, does not put new cash into the hands of producers or cooperatives, cash that they can use to pay back a loan, for example. So understandably, this means producers can be reluctant to invest in climate action given limited cash reserves, market volatility, and other livelihood or business priorities. So we need to make climate finance affordable for producers by making sure they can afford the interest rates on loans, that they can pay back the investment within a reasonable time period, that they are protected from risk should a new climate innovation not work out as planned. In our work, we've seen that this usually means that adaptation finance is not a purely commercial opportunity for investors. Investors will need to blend commercial and grant capital to make the economics work, for producers and for investors' own balance sheets. Blending capital in this way requires creativity and ongoing philanthropic investments. But if climate finance is not made affordable for producers, we risk further burdening already vulnerable local communities. Which leads me to my last point, um, which is that finance alone will not build resilient coffee supply chains. We know that climate change is making coffee production more expensive through a combination of higher production costs and higher risk of crop failure. So financing, especially debt financing, can only go so far in building the climate resilience of individual coffee farms or entire supply chains. Because if coffee doesn't provide a good economic return to producers, producers, again, won't have the resources or incentives to invest in new adaptation practices, even if adaptation financing becomes available in their communities. Producers need to know that adaptation investments will pay off, that at a minimum there will be a market for their coffee in the future, ideally that they would receive an upside for improving the quality or resilience of their harvest. For years, for example, we've seen smallholders defer replanting old coffee trees because they worry the market won't reward that investment. The same dynamic applies to longer term investments in adaptation and resilience. So to really get climate finance flowing to smallholders, we hope to see more incentives for adopting improved practices like agroforestry, like organic fertilization from supply chain partners, from traders, from roasters, from buyers. Encouragingly, we're starting to see some incentives, especially we're seeing some buyers offer financial incentives for adopting agroforestry practices. We need more of these programs scaled across supply chains because together we think the market signal plus financing could really drive change on the ground. So with that, I will close my comments and I look forward to the discussion with the group. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, also your final words uh, referred uh, still a bit back to, for example, the talk of Janina yesterday, also about the different roles uh, in the coffee supply chain, the different responsibilities, and also that, uh, yeah, growing coffee still must make sense also for the farmers, like the, mm -hmm. also what, uh, what Christian, for example, also mentioned that there's, yeah, the adaptation, the diversification, or maybe a transformation necessary. Um, so thank you very much for pointing all that out. 
uh, we have uh, lots of questions actually. <laughs> so uh, let's see how far we come in the next 10 minutes. Um, uh, I just start with the first one. Uh, could you share more on the low carbon fertilization plants? Certainly. So um, to take a step back a little bit in terms of soil regeneration and some of the challenges that we're seeing in, in the businesses that we work with, we're seeing that across the board, many coffee smallholders are not fertilizing enough to even replenish the nutrients that are leaving the farm every year in the form of coffee, right? You know, every year, a certain amount of nutrition is leaving the soil, going into the coffee, going into the coffee beans, leaving the farm, and farmers at least need to be replacing that nutritional loss as well as building soil health over time. Um, and so a lot of what we look at um, when it comes to regenerative um, fertilization plans is getting farmers up to that minimum replenishment level where they are at least replacing the nutrients that are leaving the farm every year. Ideally through organic inputs, um, if not 100% organic through um, lower carbon, um, lower carbon fertil um, fertilizers. And so that's really what we're looking at when, when a business is presenting a fertilization plan. Um, and part of that is that it needs to be informed by soil analysis. So we actually have a good sense of um, what is the nutritional profile of the soils that farmers are working with? What are the gaps? Um, what is really needed in terms of the macro and micro, micro nutrients that farmers need to be applying to make sure that, again, we're, we're, we're feeding the soil, um, but not in a situation where farmers are overusing um, conventional inputs um, and, and generating too many emissions from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that might also point a bit in the direction of yesterday's talk about the circular economy with the compost, Bokashi, biochar mm -hmm. application, I guess. Okay, good. Um, is the report on coffee farming being carbon negative in certain countries available online? Could you specify in which countries this study was carried out, please? Yes, it is available online. Um, it's available on Root Capital's website. So if you go to rootcapital.org, um, into our publications, you can find um, an executive report as well as a technical report with many, many, many additional details. Um, so please do check that out. Um, and most of the research was done in Peru. Um, most of the farms were located in Peru. Um, there were also farms in Honduras and Guatemala that participated in that study. Thank you. And then we have one uh, question that is maybe a bit specific or case to case dependent. How many trees per hectare farmers have to plant to get some money from carbon payments? And what are your specific recommendations for smallholder coffee farmers? Mm. So the the carbon payments issue is a is a complex matter. Um, we have been looking into the extent to which carbon markets, particularly the offset market, could represent an interesting form of climate finance for coffee smallholders in particular. Unfortunately, what we're seeing right now, and, and many others point this out as well, is that the current price of carbon offsets is too low to really cover the true cost of implementing carbon projects with smallholders of any kind, and, and that applies to coffee smallholders as well. So right now we're seeing that it's not um, a really significant income generating opportunity for, for coffee producers. It can be a way to help finance investments that coffee producers or producer organizations want to do anyway, right? So for example, if a, if a, a producer organization wants to improve agroforestry systems, um, carbon can be a component of the revenue stream, but it's not gonna fully pay for the costs. Um, Certainly the, the benefit from carbon offsets will be higher if you're going from full sun situations to kind of full agroforestry systems because you're then seeing a larger coffee bump. Um, otherwise, again, you're gonna see smaller carbon revenues if you're you know, going from 50 shade trees per hectare to 150 shade trees per hectare, for example. So it really varies on the context. Okay, thank you. Um... Yeah, one, one question is, uh, what kind of climate financial products is uh, root capital testing or implementing in Latin America? Is there available information? Mm -hmm. So mostly our focus in Latin America has been on these um, soil loans, on input loans, making sure that farmers have access to um, 
to funding during the harvest management period to um, pay for organic or low carbon inputs and also to pay for labor. And so a lot of our financing is also going to help producers pay for short-term labor, labor to help them implement um, or apply um, these fertilizers, which is often a, a key challenge as well. So that's been our main focus to date, um, particularly in Central America. Um, we're also looking um, again at things like kind of farm level or business level post-harvesting infrastructure. So do businesses need more of these covered, um, covered dryers either at the farm level or the business level? Um, do businesses need water efficient processing infrastructure, especially in regions where, where water um, is becoming increasingly, water access is becoming increasingly a challenge? So those are things that we're actively looking at right now um, and hoping to roll out um, in Latin America um, in the next several years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And one final question. Um, uh, what are the steps that farmers or producer organizations need to take when they want to apply for financial support from World Capital? Certainly. So um, we have um, offices and loan officers in the countries in which we work, um, for example, in Peru or Guatemala or Uganda or Kenya. Um, and so we have local teams who are available to receive applications for financing from producer organizations. We have certain um, eligibility criteria. Um, for example, you know, we're looking at businesses with at least $250,000 in annual revenue. Um, there are other eligibility criteria available on our website. Um, and then um, most importantly, we're looking for businesses that are seeking to generate a positive impact for farmers, employees, and for their local environment. So um, part of our due diligence is really understanding the impact, um, the positive impacts that these businesses are having and how we can better support them in their work. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth Teek, um, for your time, for all this information. And yeah, um, thanks again for for being here today with us. A pleasure, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. So we are coming already to our final talk of the whole symposium. Um, we are welcoming Claire Rhodes. She's the CEO and founder of Producers Direct. Hello, Claire. Hi, Annika, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Greetings to London, I think. Yes, that's right, yes, I'm, I'm here in London, yes. Yeah, welcome. I just say a few words to introduce you, um, or basically Producers Direct also. Uh, Producers Direct is a farmer-facing organization focused on increasing smallholders' resilience and power in the food system, and it works directly with smallholder communities and farmer organizations to strengthen resilience, increase incomes, and build farmers' leadership. And uh, yeah, Claire, I think you brought a whole bouquet of uh, lessons uh, that you learned, <laughs> particularly in the field of digitalization. So your talk is uh, digital innovation, the promise versus the reality for smallholder coffee farmers. Yeah, please, thanks for presenting. Thanks so much, Annika, and, and thank you everyone um, also for the opportunity to be here today. It's um, it's a pleasure to listen to all of the other speakers in, in this afternoon session and um, rich learnings, definitely, for, for all of us, I think. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. As Annika was saying, my name is Claire Rhodes, and I'm the CEO of Producers Direct. And yes, today I'm going to focus on the promise versus the reality of digital innovation for smallholder farmers. And as Annika was saying, um, drawing on Producers Direct's experiences and lessons we've learned um, working with smallholder farmers over the last 15 years, particularly focusing on how uh, to shape the development of digital tools to answer farmers' needs. And maybe to say that we as Producers Direct, we haven't cracked it yet. We don't have all of the answers. We continue to keep learning. Um, and um, so very much looking forward to sharing experiences with you all here today. Uh, next slide, please. So before um, going into the uh, experiences specifically on digital in innovations, I wanted to briefly introduce you to Producers Direct. So Producers Direct was established as a not-for-profit in 2009 to be an organization led by farmers for farmers. And we focus on inspiring smallholder farmers to join forces, share knowledge, and strengthen their resilience and incomes together. Uh, next slide, please. Overall, 
Our work has reached and benefited over 1 million smallholder farmers across East Africa and Latin America so far. And over the years, we've looked to build a farmer-led model that offers a range of bundled services across training, finance, market access, and data services, blending both in-person and digital approaches, all essentially designed by farmers for farmers, with, as Annika was saying, with the ultimate aim of improving farmers' livelihoods through income improvement and enhanced resilience, including to, to climate change. Next slide, please. So the potential for digital and data innovations to transform the livelihoods of the world's 1 billion smallholder farmers is huge, particularly in relation to enhancing smallholders' resilience and capability to adapt to climate change. And yet, you know, we see all around us a real proliferation of digital agricultural technologies being developed. And yet we're still also seeing significant barriers to actually smallholders using these technologies um, and benefiting from them. And so today is really about sharing um, lessons from some of the experiences we've had. And I'd be interested to hear from you all on whether or not you've experienced similar. So the first lesson we've learned, um, when investing in the design and testing of digital agricultural technologies, it's crucial to design from the foundation of the farmer's reality, knowledge and experience. You know, just as an example, next slide, please. This is a typical data management system for a smallholder farmer. So smallholder farmers are facing significant numerous challenges on a daily basis and the increasing risks associated with changing climates. And they're managing these risks with minimal access to the external data um, that a lot of us benefit um, and, 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 and have a lot of kind of um, opportunity to, to access. Um, next slide, please. And furthermore, you know, still a lot of digital agricultural technologies are being designed for smartphone use. You know, but let's remember, 4 billion people in the world are still not connected to the internet. And there's still a considerable usage gap. So 3.4 billion people who are living in areas that are actually covered by mobile broadband networks are still not actually using those mobile internet opportunities. And that's particularly true for women, as we heard earlier, earlier today. Women living in rural areas are 15% less likely to use mobile internet. And still we're seeing um, smallholder farmers, particularly elderly generations of farmer, still trusting SMS most when it comes to digital information channels. Now that's not to say that smartphone, smartphones and smartphone apps, they, they do have a crucial role to play. I, you know, I definitely believe that. And you'll see later in the presentation that you know, we as producers direct are designing digital tools for smartphones. But the main thing is that the smartphone apps that, that are designed to support smallholder farmers, they can't be designed in isolation without thinking about the reality uh, that surrounds those smallholder farmers. You need to be thinking about the whole system. So for example, how can the smartphone app be paired with SMS-based services for farmers who are not comfortable using a smartphone? Uh, next slide, please. So farmer-led design is at the center of Producers Direct's model. And the co-development of digital tools with farmers is really key for these solutions to ultimately be sustainable and to scale successfully. If you're designing a solution for smallholders, you have to involve them from the onset. Just as Victor was saying in the earlier session about, about the importance of involvement, not just sharing once something um, has, has been done. And at times, actually engaging smallholders can feel really difficult and time consuming especially if you're going back and forth on designing multiple iterations of an idea. But ultimately the result will be stronger in the end and the investment of that time is, is beyond worth it. Next slide, please. And then investing in farmer leaders to take the leadership in scaling the digital solutions is essential for driving impact. At Producers Direct, we invest in a network of farmer and youth leaders over the communities where we work. And so far we've grown our network to over a thousand leaders across East Africa and Latin America. And these leaders are selected on the basis that they're already experimenting uh, with their own ideas or demonstrating that they've successfully adopted new practices. And so we as Producers Direct, we continue to invest in them to showcase their ideas and innovations. So growing a network of champions for innovation and good practices across the smallholder communities where we're working. Next slide, please. 
If you're not designing explicitly for women smallholder farmers, you're designing for men. And this was really emphasized to us by our partner, idea.org. You know, again, as we've heard earlier, female smallholder farmers are typically not involved enough in the design of solutions that ultimately are intended to benefit them. And this is particularly true for all of the agricultural technology and data services that are being designed. If you're designing a solution for female smallholder farmers, they have to play a leadership role in designing um, that technology and in the design process from the onset. Uh, next slide, please. I think also, as, as was highlighted yesterday, there's really important roles for youth and opportunities. Youth leaders can play key roles in innovation and experimentation within rural farming communities. Next slide, please. Especially in relation to digital agri-tech and data services. Now, we as Producers Direct, we see youth leaders within smallholder communities really excited to try on new ideas and innovate. And they're typically much more comfortable using new technologies like smartphones and are perhaps also less risk averse than uh, more elderly smallholder farmers. And so by engaging youth, they can be real pioneers of new technology and can enable older generations of farmers to observe successful innovations before adopting them themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So the example I wanted to talk to you today about from Producers Direct Work is a digital service that we've been uh, developing called Croppy. Um, and we've been really lucky that the German government, GIZ, um, their i for ag and Fair Forward programs have been really supporting us with this work, which, we, which we're extremely appreciative of. And we've also been working um, on Copy in partnership with SEAT, the International Centre for Tropical Agriculture, and IDEO.org. In fact, one of the lead team at SEAT was uh, Dr. Christian Bunn, who shared um, with you yesterday. So I think there's a lot of uh, synergies and connections between all of the the different work that we're doing. Uh, and I'm focusing on Croppy as an example of the importance of a farmer-led design process in enabling smallholders to benefit from pioneering digital technologies such as artificial intelligence. And really thinking about how we transform the capability of smallholder farmers to benefit and use data insights, enable, enabling them to support the management of climate risks. So one example of the opportunity for AI to support smallholder agriculture is in relation to yield predictions, both within a season and multi-seasonal. And that's what we've been developing so far with Croppy. Uh, next slide, please. So the idea behind Croppy is that a farmer takes a photo of their coffee bush using Croppy at the start of a season and immediately receives an AI generated yield prediction back based on that photo. These yield predictions, they're then um, essentially used to be paired with agronomic tips and financial advice, so that as a result of the yield prediction, uh, farmers can be supported to enhance their on-farm and financial planning on the basis of the yield predictions that they're receiving at the start of the season. With the aim that across multiple seasons, Croppy then documents both predicted and actual coffee yields enabling farmers to track and build up a picture of their farm's long-term performance, while also at the same time, generating crucial insights directly from smallholder farmers on the impacts of climate change on their yields and on their farm's performance. And so SEAT developed the AI model that can be used to support coffee yield predictions, uh, with the model being trained using photos of coffee bushes that were taken by farmers on a smartphone. Uh, next slide, please. And then on the farmer side, Producers Direct and IDEO.org have been working with smallholder farmers to co-design what the Croppy experience looks like for the farmers themselves. Both working with farmers who are comfortable using smartphones, but also farmers who aren't comfortable using smartphones too. And so there have been many lessons and challenges in designing Croppy and we're still continuing to learn. We're by no means anywhere close to <laughs> having completed all of our lesson learning, uh, but I only have time to talk about three main ones today. So uh, next slide, please. So lesson one from the development of Croppy. Data insights need to be in an understandable, actionable formats. The key lesson here that we continue to learn is the way the data is shared back with farmers is critical. And it's really important to work with the farmers to understand what it is that they need in what format 
and what it is that they can actually use. You know, what might seem clear to one person isn't necessarily the same for another. And so we've been working on pairing the yield estimates generated from copy with actionable tips that farmers can easily adopt, um, either on, on farm practices or financial planning. And we're continuing to work with farmers groups and get their feedback on whether or not the information that's being shared through copy is valuable and easy to action. Next slide, please. So second lesson, um, farmers need to be able to trust the source of the data. And I think that's true of everyone, right? It's very natural to want to establish where the data is coming from before taking a decision on whether or not to trust on it and, and act on it, especially when it's, it's so crucial to your livelihood. Now, we've seen time and time again over the years with Producers Direct, the value and the importance of farmer to farmer knowledge sharing. Farmers are much more likely to adopt a technology or a farming practice if they've seen evidence that it's worked well for a peer, a, f a fellow farmer. So one of the things that we're working on is to better integrate within Quapi farmer reviews and farmer feedback so that a farmer considering whether or not to use Quapi can connect and learn from other farmers who have already tested it. Uh, next slide, please. And then I talked earlier in the presentation about the challenges of designing services on a smartphone when the reality is that most of the smallholders we work with, particularly the elderly generations of farmers, are not comfortable using digital tools themselves and, and much prefer a pen and a paper. And this was definitely a significant design challenge for Croppy because a smartphone had to be used to take the photos of the coffee bushes. And so recognizing this uh, with Croppy, we also we worked with youth leaders within the communities to test the photo taking aspects of Croppy because they were the ones that were most excited to get involved in the testing using their smartphone. And at the same time, we also tested how farmers can access Croppy's yield predictions and associated services by SMS or WhatsApp to ensure that farmers who are not comfortable using a smartphone can still benefit from, from the service. Uh, next slide, please. And so just to close, oh, and I'm missing the last slide, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so we definitely have big ambitions to scale Croppy, including by looking at whether other AI models can be integrated into Croppy to improve the services it delivers to farmers. So for example, there are AI models to detect coffee pests, for example, on, on coffee bushes. And continuing to test how Croppy can increasingly connect farmers with the data they need to take action and proactively respond to the climate risks they're increasingly facing. With the ultimate aim of putting Croppy and the power of digital and data innovation firmly into the hands of smallholders worldwide. So for anyone who's interested in learning more or is also developing similar approaches and are interested in partnering, we'd love to hear from you. You know, Croppy, we're looking to open source it. Um, we know there's a lot of people doing really exciting work in this space and we'd love to connect with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claire, for sharing your lessons learned and your experiences with uh, Croppy also. Um, if, I, if I understand it right, uh, or I think we talked about it before, um, Croppy is uh, currently in the beta version. Uh, so you're currently testing, right? Yes. Um, exactly. Okay. Um, when, when can we um, expect the final version? Is there already a timeline? <laughs> <laughs> It's a really good question. I think um, we will continue to um, iterate on copy and continue adding more services. Um, we're at the stage now where the yield prediction model is working well. Um, and so um, it's possible um, for people to be able to test uh, the yield predictions. Um, and uh, we're also um, seeing good results on um, the interface between using the smartphone app and kind of the SMS actionable tips going out to farmers like that. So, so one of the big focuses for, for this year is to really um, demonstrate the, the proof of concept that farmers um, can benefit from, from copy, even though they don't have access to a smartphone. So, so that's what we're focusing on this year um, and really also um, building out um, the advice um, that is being um, offered through copy on financial services planning, as well as um, agronomic tips. So um, in terms of releasing further versions of the app, they'll continue to be released, but I think um, it will continue to be a work in progress as we build more features for, for quite a long time.
maybe yeah. maybe forever <laughs> <laughs> yeah and totally understand i mean also yeah everything is developing so if to just keep the app always uh, up to date that's that's also uh, important i guess um so basically the version currently is already available and people can start using it already right Yeah, so there's a test version available um, on the App Store. The thing that I would say is that so far we have tested Quapi in Peru, uh, Colombia and Uganda. Um, and every time uh, we uh, scale to a new country, um, the the AI model needs to be uh, validated based on um, information that's, that's available locally. For example, um, the AI model needs to be trained based on um, different varieties of, of coffee and things like mm -hmm. that. So... So um so yeah so in terms of scaling um we've we've had much more focus on uh, getting it right in Peru and Colombia and and now in Uganda, uh, just okay. in terms of whether or not it's it's actually working well for people to test in different geographies. Yeah okay that uh, already answers one question that was uh, put into the Q and A section. What is the coverage and scope of Probi? So in the future, you are also planning to extend the scope from the countries you just mentioned. Yes, we'd love to. And if people are interested in, in working with us to, to test it in different places, we'd be we'd be very open to that. Um, obviously, um, some of the expansion to new geographies um, is funding dependent, but um, certainly um, in the in the work that we've had supported so far, we've had very good progress in Peru, Colombia and Uganda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, there was one question also um, directed in towards uh, financing. Uh, Does farmers direct uh, funds initiatives in digitalization or is willing to invest in piloting climate solutions? Yes, we don't. Um, so we, we're a nonprofit. So our funding um, comes from us as producers direct raising money. And um, as I was highlighting earlier, the, the German government, GIZ, has been a, a close supporter of our work, which has been fantastic. So um, our ability to run kind of uh, testing in different places with different partners To some extent, is funding dependent. It depends if it's if it's looking at a small pilot of an existing technology, um, which can often be easily achieved with existing resources of partners coming together, or if if it requires um, you know a huge amount of investment in new development and things, which obviously does does require funds. But again, if 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 people have ideas, um, it would be it would be great to hear from them, and then we can we can see whether or not there's scope to to work together on on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Um, another question is: Have you tried to triangulate actual coffee yields against the yield predictions using Croppy? Yes, we have. That was one of the. Um, uh, I didn't talk about it much in the presentation because it was quite complicated, but right from Day one of crop testing, we um, we ran in parallel activities to to track the um, the manual counts of the um, for yield predictions at the start of the season, um, and then look at the actual yields, um, you know, at, at the point of coffee harvesting, and look at how um, accurate the AI um, was in in the prediction. So. So there's um behind the scenes and and um Siat has done a very good job on this. There's been a high investment in um looking at how you support the training of the AI model based on actual data to validate it. And so um the work so far, we've we've done two full years. So we had two two coffee seasons to to test in. So uh, the first coffee season we had we had many challenges on the accuracy of the AI. For example, it, it depended very much on the quality of the photos and things like that. So we did another iteration. We looked at what would be needed to support people to take more accurate photos and then and then ran it for a second season. And so by the end of the second season, we were seeing accuracy levels of between 80 and 95 percent, which we were very excited about. So so we'll keep we'll keep testing it because it's always, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something we need to keep validating and. As I was mentioning, in, in new geographies, I we wouldn't necessarily expect it to work well straight away. You'd have to do a bit of that training. Hopefully, mm -hmm. as, as we learn more, the training will become more efficient because we know what it is that we need to be focusing on in order to train the model quickly. Okay, yeah, thanks. Also, one thing that I was wondering is, um, does the Croppy app uh, recognize the quality of the coffee cherries and detect if they are maybe infested by a pest or disease and that might reduce the yield? 
Um, I, I, I wish Christian was on this panel as well, because he'd know that better. Um, I, I'd say yes and no. So what it what it's looking at is it detects the differences in the color of the cherries. And so when um, there's incidences of pests that, that cause a discoloration, then it, it does it does take that into account. But um, one of the things that we do want to do more of is, is look at what other um, models have been trained to support pest detection, not necessarily just in the coffee cherries, but on the coffee leaves as well, and see if we can achieve more accuracy on pest detection in, in future um, generations of coffee. Because at the moment, it's, it's mainly uh, the AI is mainly looking at recognizing the coffee cherry and the color of the coffee cherry to, to generate the prediction. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think this is uh, our final question that we have here. What are ways to design software, especially for women? What are examples? Yeah, well, I think I think the main thing um, is to firstly, um, as we were hearing earlier, I thought the um, presentation earlier was was really important as a as a precursor for this. Um, really understanding kind of the needs of female farmers as a start point. Um, you know, I think there's there's a lot of challenges and, you know, producers direct, we can be guilty of this where we think, okay, if we are putting together farmer design groups and we have, say, for example, 50% of the participants are, are women, then we'll ensure that, you know, that the solution that we're developing is is meeting the needs of women. But that that actually is is not the case at all. Um, and I think so really looking at, you know, how how to structure um, the design groups so that you do have design groups um, that are 100 percent female farmers, not because you're designing something exclusively for them, but to create the space and the confidence um, that they need to be able to genuinely feel like they're participating in the design process and not 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 just participating um, as, as part of, of something bigger. I think the other thing, um, maybe just to share an example, if there's time, because it was a big lesson learned for us, is is it goes back to what I was saying about really understanding the realities. Um, when we were in the early stages of crop testing, we um, had invited a group of female farmers to come to um, a farmer design workshop, and before coming, um, we had asked them, you know, are, do you have access to a smartphone? Do you actually, um, you know, do you do you feel comfortable using a smartphone? And and we had selected the female farmers that that did that, that said yes to that. And then the workshop took place, and um, none of the female farmers, um, when they arrived, had their smartphones. I'm like, oh, that's that's strange. You know, we 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 thought we'd uh, invited you because you were comfortable using a smartphone, and they were like, well, yes, I am, but you know, like my son is using the smartphone today because he has to do his learning at school. So just because I have access to it, it doesn't mean that I'm the priority for being able to use it. Um, and that, so that was a really important lesson for us. You know, sometimes you think um, you've understood the reality, but actually it's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. And I think it really is, again, also about asking the right questions, like uh, think of things like you would never think of, like, um, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I, I particularly also liked uh, the slide with your statement, if you are not designing explicitly for women, uh, you are designing for men. And I think that is just very true, uh, like all over, um, yeah, basically every area. And um, that is very true. So uh, it's great that you are considering women also in, in the process of um, building Croppy. And yeah, I think uh, there are no more questions in the chat. So Claire, thank you so much for all these thank insights. You sharing yeah, your experiences. Pleasure. <laughs> Lovely to um, chat with everyone today. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we have reached the end of our symposium. Um, yeah, again, to all our amazing speakers, a big, big thank you. And uh, it was really invaluable insights, knowledge, experiences that you shared. And we appreciate a lot that you took the time and effort to make your contribution to our symposium. And also uh, thanks to this great audience. Thank you all for showing up. Thank you for your big interest in this topic and for your questions and your support. And um, yeah, um, if you're interested in, yeah, 
any collaboration, learning more about coffee and climate, um, you can, of course, connect uh, with our uh, program manager, uh, Stefan Ruge, who held the talk yesterday. And um, yeah, the recording of this symposium will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, the YouTube channel of the Initiative for Coffee and Climate. Um, you will receive an info with a link um, in a follow-up email, um, presumably next week. And yeah, my colleague has already posted in the chat um, the links to our newsletter and our social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. Uh, so if you are interested in events in the future or any updates uh, from our organization, uh, please just follow and subscribe to our channels. And yeah, I hope we will see each other again at some point in the future. And thanks again for being here with us. Bye.